So let me first uh, thank you, uh, thank the uh, organizers for inviting me here and uh, uh, give this uh, presentation. Um, I was asked to talk about the past, present, and future of multidimensional scaling, and when, when doing so, um, or when I was preparing this presentation, I think I'm lagging behind by something like 15 years. So my, my uh, the future starts about 10 years ago. Uh, the present uh, around 1985, uh, nine, uh, yeah, around 1985, and the past is kind of before that. So I hope you will, will forgive me uh, for that. Um, another issue is that I think the area of multidimensional scaling is um, is, is very wide. Uh, there are, have, have been lots of different developments. I've been involved in some algorithmic uh, um, yeah, parts of multidimensional scaling. So I will emphasize um, more the history of, of uh, uh, the algorithms that have been used or the things that I find important in, uh, in multidimensional scaling. So let's first have a look, for those of you, um, well, who are not familiar with multidimensional scaling, although I understand uh, that uh, Patrick Meyer has given a, um, a workshop on the Tuesday, I believe. Um, so quite, quite a few of you uh, should already know this. Um, let's consider this uh, table of traveling times here in France. And of course, here you see the normal map of, uh, of France. Uh, but if I want to show a map such that it represents the traveling times by train as good as possible, then the geom geometric map is not the right one. This is the one that goes with it. Uh, where you can see, for example, that the distance between uh, Lille and Paris and uh, Paris and Tours is, is uh, quite small because there's a TGV connection. Um, let me tell you that these traveling times are about 10 years old. So there could be a few new stretches uh, that are not taken into account into this, uh, this right, uh, right side map. But in essence, what this map will show you is if you're planning to travel from one part or from one town to the other town by train, uh, then this is your expectation of, of traveling times. And um, in contrast to, to this uh, particular one. And this is exactly what multidimensional scaling does. It translates a table with essentially dissimilarities between pairs of objects, in this case these are towns, uh, in such a way that we have corresponding distances um, in a plot. And of course, in this particular case, uh, I, I was able to uh, get the, uh, also a transformation of the borders, and, and usually you won't have this. So this is a kind of the schematic uh, overview. We start off with dissimilarities, and essentially we are interested in a plot where distances between pairs of points so say, for example, between O1 and O2, or uh, object 1 and object uh, 3, uh, match the corresponding dissimilarities in the table as close as possible. So the first sentence of our book essentially captures this. Multidimensional scaling is a method that represents a measurement of similarity or dissimilarity among pairs of objects as distances between points of a low dimensional space. Um, as Jan already indicated, is that it originates in, um, uh, in psychology, or we will see that in, in a moment, um, but has spread out to a variety of different uh, uh, disciplines. Um, okay, let's not talk about dissimilarities and similarities. Let's look at some, uh, some history. This is actually a, um, a table of distances. Uh, it was made by a Dutch cartographer, Jacob van Langeren, and it uh, dates back to 1635. Uh, and I would like to think of it as being uh, one of the first instances of multidimensional scaling. Because here we have this, this table of, uh, of distances, and it doesn't look like an ordinary table because the towns at the top here are in reverse order with respect uh, to the towns in the rows, but they are the same. Um, and there is a map. 
this is, uh, by the way, um, uh, one that uh, uh, that I obtained through John Gower, or let's let's say I made a um, a scan out of this map, and the scan of uh, the map itself is maybe of of this size, so it's really very small, something like 10 by 10 centimeters. But I consider this to be um, one of the first instances of uh, multidimensional scaling because we start off with a distance matrix uh, that is being also represented in terms of a map. And I believe that uh, and such maps are available for entire, all the counties of England or, okay. Uh, so this is just, uh, just one of them. Now, what I will do is I will highlight some topics or some, maybe some papers, some issues that came up um, with some of the people uh, and we'll highlight several of these, uh, of, of these topics. So I think uh, the first important step in, in, in multidimensional scaling was classical uh, multidimensional scaling. And uh, that was first done by uh, Torgson in 1958 uh, and independently by Gower in 1966. Um, and which amounts to minimizing what is now being called the strain uh, loss function, uh, which you see over here, where this, these are dissimilarities and this indicates that the element wise they are being squared. This indicates uh, a matrix of uh, Euclidean distances being element-wise squared uh, based on the coordinate matrix uh, X, and the J's here are uh, centering uh, matrices. And it turns out that if you, if you work this out, there's a very neat, nice uh, eigen decomposition of this particular um, matrix. So that's one of the reasons why um, well, this is still uh, used uh, quite often. Now, the next step came in psychometrics, um, uh, first by, by Shepard in 1962, and uh, he provided a kind of heuristic for doing multidimensional scaling, but Jan also indicated this uh, in his talk. Uh, the next step was done by, uh, by Joe Kruskal. Um, and he established uh, a loss function. And this is the loss function that goes with it, which, which is now being called stress one. Where you see, think about this for, for the moment as being dissimilarities between all the pairs, so that we, the, one, the table that we had before. Uh, the distances, so essentially, of course, what this says is uh, try to find distances, Euclidean, in principle, Euclidean distances, well, not necessarily so. Um, try to find Euclidean distances such that for every pair they look as much as possible uh, in least square sense uh, to their um, uh, dissimilarities. However, uh, Joe Kruskal made one additional step, which is he changed the dissimilarities to so-called um, uh, d-hats or um, pseudo uh, distances that are monotonically, trans, uh, uh, mono, monotonically related with the um, original dissimilarities. So this is, uh, I would say, the birth of uh, optimal scaling. Um, and it was all being done in, by minimizing this particular uh, uh, loss function. So a very classic example is the so-called Rothkopf uh, Morse code confusion data, where um, I think these were uh, soldiers or so that participated in an experiment uh, where pairs of Morse codes were being um, uh, given. And the only answer they should tell is uh, yes, the two Morse codes uh, are the same or the two Morse codes are different. So for example, beep dash, uh, is it the same or not as, uh, uh, well, yeah, dot, uh, long, dot, dash, dot. Um, they, they did both pairs, so that gives rise to this confusion matrix. Um, these data are uh, similarities, you can change them into dissimilarities. 
Um, and what I also did was uh, I omitted the diagonal and, and um, uh, symmetrized it. And this allows me to, um, well, to show this to you. This is not a solution yet. So let me also show you a stress plot. And here you see an algorithm, uh, which I'll explain in a moment, the, um, the majorization algorithm uh, in, uh, in, in practice. Um, so let me go back and show it again. So one of the features of the majorizing algorithm, by the way, is that indeed uh, the stress goes down, monotonically uh, goes down. Um, and well, this is, uh, this is what you can, uh, can see out of it. Um, for example, we can see that a single dot and a single dash are being uh, confused very easily because they're close together. But for example, the single dot uh, will not be confused with, say, uh, this Morse code or the Morse code uh, at, the, at the lower left uh, corner. Uh, so essentially, you can, you, you can look at the pattern. Um, for example, these are all the Morse codes that consist, consist of two um, elements. And you, you can see that uh, they are relatively easily um, confused. But the least confusion is, at least, uh, is between uh, the two dots and uh, the dash and the dots, so relatively. And we see that the Morse codes that have uh, only like a very few uh, elements are also not confused with Morse codes consisting of five elements. Well, there's much more that can be said about, this, um, um, about these Morse codes, but uh, I, will, I will not do so. Uh, right now. And I would like to go to next uh, topic, um, Louis Gutman, who, who has several contributions to multidimensional scaling. But I will focus here at, um, at one. That's the idea of having facet theory and uh, doing regional interpretations. And in essence, what facet theory is doing is that there's um, extra information available, more or less in a, in a similar way, um, well, as external variables, uh, in, like in canonical uh, um, uh, correspondence analysis. Um, so we have extra information on the objects. And in particular, uh, Gutman wanted to generate the objects uh, by design. So let's, let's have a look. Um, here at a more schematic uh, view. So in essence, what he wanted to have is that every object, and usually that was an item in a questionnaire, uh, was generated in such a way um, that it could be categorized among three different facets. And each facet could be one of, um, in this case, uh, three uh, choices. Um, the second facet has only two different um, possibilities, and the third one has, again, three. Um, he wanted to use this together with so-called regional hypotheses of these facets. So that means that every object, objects are being here represented as these uh, letters, but now they are being, uh, the letters are being labeled by a facet. So one of the regional uh, hypotheses type was that a single facet would give rise to a partitioning, uh, an axial, axial partitioning. So essentially straight lines that separate the space into um, here a part where only A is being scored on the first facet, here only B, and here only uh, C. A second one was the so-called uh, modular one, or I tend to call them circular uh, uh, shapes. So where the re regions are essentially uh, circular or concentric uh, circles. And the third one is polar or pie-shaped uh, regions. Now, we, we have worked on this, and um, the, um, the axial uh, one can be even fitted in uh, the, the present uh, prox scale uh, algorithm um, by using external constraints that also allow for optimal scaling of these constraints. So let's, let's have a look. 
we still have the Morse codes over here, but if you look at these Morse codes, there are two extra properties that you can think of. And one of them is the length it takes for the Morse code. And the second property is the ratio of uh, dots and dashes. So in, for the first one, for the A, of course, uh, there's an equal number of dots uh, and dashes. For the B, there are uh, more dots than dashes. And for the C, is again equal, and so on. And you can easily imagine that confusion of the Morse codes um, are related uh, to this. So let's have a look. This was essentially uh, the similar unconstrained plot that we had before. Um, and if, if you look at that particular uh, solution, you cannot really make straight lines. So what used to be done is simply, or what Gutman did, was simply draw them by hand. Um, and, and hopefully uh, that would fit. And you see that here at the bottom, we get a bit into trouble. Um, what is possible, and we did this uh, for the first time in uh, one of our books, um, is to impose these restrictions through uh, constrained multidimensional scaling. And indeed, you, you get, um, you could say, a consistent uh, solution at the cost of some extra stress. Um, but it, well, it is, uh, uh, you could say, theory consistent, uh, and indeed um, might be easier to interpret uh, this right-hand side uh, solution than the unconstrained left-hand side. Um, uh, currently, we are also working on, uh, or we have ideas to how to impose these other type of restrictions, but let's say that it's comp computationally not very easy to, do, to, uh, to implement. Let us look at another contribution uh, to, um, I would say, to multidimensional scaling, or a highlight. Um, that is uh, three-way MDS um, models, and in particular, uh, INSCAL and EDOSCAL. Um, which has been popularized by uh, uh, Doug Carroll. So essentially what that does is that, um, l let's have a look at the data analysis problem. So instead of one single dissimilarity matrix, we have, uh, for example, three uh, or four, so in some sense replicated. And these replications could be individuals or it could be time points or uh, anything else. Um, so the model that is being uh, used um, in dimension weighting uh, models is that you have one single common configuration, one common space, but you allow the individual spaces to be equal to the common space, but being stretched or shrunk along a dimension. And then, for example, if your common space would look like this uh, square, then um, these could be um, admit, admissible rectangles um, yeah, with different shapes. So that's essentially what, uh, what the model does. Um, a second um, version of this, of this case is allowing uh, not only for diagonal, but for any matrix uh, S. So that includes first a rotation of the common space and then um, stretching or shrinking. So you, you get sort of these shared uh, versions of the original uh, square. So I think that that's one of the, uh, also, also like an important contribution to, uh, to multidimensional scaling. And I think that uh, I might be towards the end of the of the past. So this is, I guess, where a part of the present uh, uh, starts to come in. Um, and that is essentially the majorization approach to um, multidimensional scaling. So the other two were already mentioned, so we'll not go into them again. Uh, but let's go into uh, majorization. And I, I think why that's such a nice um, system, because it's very comprehensive and it gives it allows to do all sorts uh, of thing, things, including uh, constraints on the configuration, including three-way MDS models, including optimal scaling, and uh, guaranteeing mm, that the um, 
uh, the stress values uh, go down, and at the same time that you will get uh, a convergent series of, uh, of coordinates, as you just saw in my uh, animation of the, um, the Morse code uh, data. So let's have a look at um, what majorization actually is. This is um, a little example. You see an MDS plane down here. Uh, these are data that um, consist of uh, sort of similarities between stock exchanges. And uh, this is the final solution that, that you'll get out of it. Um, now, what I did was suppose, of course, I, I cannot, um, no, the, the, the stress function is, is a function of many coordinates. In this case, maybe something like uh, 26 different uh, coordinates. So that means that, that I, I cannot really plot the stress function. But what I can do is fix all the points except one, which is the Nikkei index, um, and then look what the stress function looks like if um, the, Nikkei, the, the, the two coordinates of the Nikkei index would be unknown. And this is what the stress function looks like. Now suppose that, that I, so I, suppose that I don't know where Nikkei should be located. Um, and that I start with coordinates being uh, exactly zero, the two coordinates for Nikkei. Then this is where uh, the loss uh, ends. Now what iterative majorization is doing is that it constructs um, an auxiliary function that generally is quadratic. And this auxiliary function has the property that it touches at the current uh, position, but is located above the original function anywhere else. So let's construct this uh, help function. So here you see it. Indeed, it touches over here at the, our current estimate, and it is located above the original function everywhere else. Now, for, it's easy to determine the minimum of a quadratic function, which is uh, over here. Uh, but I know that this help function is above the original function, so the original function at this particular position must be lower. And we see that it should be somewhere over there. So in fact, what I've done by making this step from here to here is uh, that I, have, I must have reduced my uh, stress uh, value. So I can do that again by replacing the auxiliary function, finding its minimum again, and keep on uh, doing this. And what you now see is real-time majorization. So in, in several steps, it's, uh, it's being, uh, um, it is finished. So this is a repetition. I can tell you this is nice, but it took me some while to program it. OK, but, but I guess you're, you're getting the essence of what iterative majorization is. And it's a very powerful uh, uh, technique. Um, so it operates on this particular uh, uh, loss function, which looked quite a bit like the one uh, proposed by, um, um, by Joe Kruskal, except uh, that there is no um, division by the sum of squared uh, distances, uh, which is replaced by adding a length constraint on the d-hats. OK. Um, also have a look at these uh, weights, the wijs. Um, these are fixed, and they are given by the user. So at the start of the algorithm, they should be known. But they are very, very powerful. And I will get back to that uh, uh, somewhat later. Uh, it also allows you to, to handle uh, missing values by simply setting some of them to be, uh, to be 0. Now, um, wh what you see here is an expression of the uh, majorizing function. And it's maybe not so important, that, well, except the, the part over here. Um, this part is quadratic in x. The, um, the one, the x bar, indicates um, the unconstrained uh, uh, solution. And then this is also, the majorized function is also uh, uh, constant in, in, uh, in this one. So 
essentially what we're having is that, as you saw, the majorizing function is quadratic. So that means that if we have constraints that we can solve easily quadratically, we can um, have them also in constrained multidimensional scaling. Um, so, for example, would be a linear constraint. So if you have external uh, variables z, you might restrict your coordinates uh, x to be a linear combinations of those, uh, the, of those z. Now, there's, there's one remark to be made over here. If you use linear restrictions in multidimensional scaling, that is, um, if you have too many variables, then there's no restriction whatsoever. So suppose that as I, if I would choose my uh, Z as being the indicator matrix, then it's exactly the same as doing the unconstrained multidimensional scaling. So if you want to do real constraints in multidimensional scaling, restrict the number of external variables to two, three, four, five, but not too many, depending on uh, how many objects you have. It also allows to uh, express three-way multi multidimensional scaling as a form of constrained multidimensional scaling. And that's quite easy to, uh, to see. So we have exactly the same dimension weighting uh, uh, um, ideas as uh, um, the Carroll had. Um, but if we make our a kind of huge dissimilarity matrix where the individual slabs that you see uh, over here are being placed on the diagonal, and the rest are blocks uh, being uh, zero, with weights uh, also uh, attached, so the off-diagonal blocks don't count at all. Um, then if, if I would do unconstrained multidimensional scaling, it would amount to simply doing, uh, in this case, four uh, different multidimensional scalings. But if you add the restriction that the x star would, would be of the form um, as indicated uh, down here, then you're doing uh, the dimension weighting models uh, as before. So that's a very neat way of, of uh, um, getting that, uh, that idea into um, this uh, majorization framework. Okay, present. Um, I, so one, one um, within this particular project of Jacqueline Mulman was to, um, to do in essence, uh, the, the entire GIFI system with all its variants, all its uh, multivariate analysis variants into um, uh, the framework of multidimensional scaling, thereby emphasizing the representation of the objects, of the individuals. Um, and, and so, so that was done, and there, are, there have been several papers um, and some programs uh, that, that came out of that. I will, would like to um, get your attention for, for this particular problem, the problem that all your dissimilarities are a constant. Because um, and th this has been done by Buya and some, some co-workers. Um, uh, Andreas uh, had the idea that what, what is the, the, the worst data that you can get in uh, multidimensional scaling? And that is if all the distances are, uh, all the dissimilarities are exactly one. Um, in usual multivariate analysis, this will not occur because, uh, well, you know, if something is a constant, if you don't have variance uh, of a variable, then you just don't include it in your analysis. So you always need to have some variance. In multidimensional scaling, this can sometimes uh, occur. And I'll show you what happens. Um, they are here. So we're doing this again. This is what, hap what is happening. So essentially what's going on is that you will get a circular shape of concentric circles. And um, I can move these around, release it, and what you will see is that the configuration again will go to a uh, circular shape, concentric circles. And there are sometimes differences if you have two or three, in, in, with this amount of, uh, of points, two or three 
um, uh, points in the middle or sometimes one. Uh, so that really depends on, on the number of, um, um, also on the number of, of objects. Now you can imagine that if you, instead of this, so what, what, I, can, what I can add is um, to show uh, the points. Now, now it really becomes clear. But if you have fewer points, if you have something like, say, 10 or, or 15 um, points, objects, and you add labels, and labels different of length, then it's very tempting to miss this type of uh, solution. And if it is this kind of solution, then essentially it is non-informative. It could be so that your data are not really uh, exactly uh, constant dissimilarities, but what we will see a li little bit uh, later on is that this can easily happen when you're dealing with large-scale multidimensional scaling. So um, I think this was uh, a nice contribution and uh, also an important uh, uh, contribution. And it turns out that um, if you do this uh, unidimensionally, that the points are equally spaced um, on a line and the, co the concentric circles we saw. In three dimensions or higher, and that's of course more difficult to visualize, the points turn out to be uh, on the sphere, so kind of equally spaced uh, and distributed uh, on the sphere. So w watch out for this and have a look uh, at what the distribution is of your D hats or your dissimilarities. Just make a histogram uh, and see if there is a lot of variation also with respect to the origin. Some other uh, topics. Uh, one of which I've been uh, quite involved in is um, local minima. And there have been several contribute, contributors, but I think the first one that really uh, worked it out was Daniel uh, uh, Defes. Uh, he uh, worked at uh, Eurostat in uh, Luxembourg. Um, who, who discovered that essentially, if you're doing unidimensional scaling, so one single dimension, um, the stress loss function becomes uh, or can be written as a combinatorial problem where it's only the order of the points on the line that matters. Um, and what, once you have those, then you can find the proper uh, solution. Uh, Larry Hubert and Phipps Araby. Uh, and Jose Fernando Vera uh, have made several contributions with uh, uh, different uh, uh, solutions uh, for this. Um, so when do they occur? Well, local minima do occur in unidimensional scaling, uh, city block uh, multidimensional scaling, and that's also an important issue. So it is my, I, I pose here, that essentially uh, Euclidean distances are the only ones that are easy to interpret. City block distances can be interpreted, but they suffer uh, quite severely uh, from local minimum problem as well. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I don't recommend using uh, city block uh, distances. Um, so when do they uh, occur? Well, it can also depend on the data. So I have one example, it's not here, uh, where with 1,000 random starts, I, uh, I found 850 uh, different local minima. So if I would, would do more uh, random starts, uh, more, most likely more uh, different local minima would come up. There are several solutions. Uh, I worked on a method called the tunneling um, method. Multiple random starts is a, uh, is a possibility. Um, the most promising one is actually, I think, the distance smoothing um, approach or possibly uh, some of these um, meta heuristics like simulated annealing uh, or genetic algorithm, uh, etc. Andreas Buyas comes up very regularly with uh, nice uh, ideas, and this is uh, another one uh, of, of his, uh, his ideas. Um, what if you make the weights dependent on the dissimilarities? So what if you uh, change the weight 
to the similarity to the power minus two. So that's exactly what I did over here. Uh, you, you, you can get this uh, into the parentheses, and then this is what happens. So the effect of doing so is that, well, see, see what the error becomes when you have a large dissimilarity or a small dissimilarity. So the large dissimilarity here, 10, uh, represented by a distance of 5, well, turns out to, to have an error of 0.5. A small dissimilarity that is represented by a distance of 1 um, also has an error of 0.5. So what this means is that we're emphasizing more the representation of the small um, dissimilarities by this particular choice. I'm going to show you the, the effect of uh, doing this. And I'm, again, I will have this, uh, this solution of these uh, stock exchanges. Um, I, will go, I will show you uh, the, uh, the, the shepherd plot with the, uh, with the errors. So what you, can, uh, what you can see here is horizontally uh, the data, and vertically you can see uh, the distances. Um, so how far a red point is to its course vertically to its corresponding um, blue point is a measure of error uh, over here. So we could say that m the largest error with the usual weights of one occur for the larger um, dissimilarities. Now what I can change over here is I can change the weights to um, minus two, but I'll do it a bit stronger, minus five. So that means that I will be emphasizing the small dissimilarities. And that's, we see one pair which is actually really very close together. And the, the other pairs here, they are represented really well. But we see also that the larger dissimilarities are either um, uh, underrepresented, so their distances are underrepresented, or uh, too large. I can do also the reverse by setting a lot of emphasis on the large uh, dissimilarities. And you see that those now are being much um, better represented. And now the error is in the small ones. So just simply choosing the weights, as I did um, over here, cho choosing the weights as uh, a function of the dissimilarities to some power, allows you to influence what is being shown in the uh, multidimensional scaling solution. So this adds flexibility. So future. The future starts 10 years ago. Um, I think an imp important step has been um, that Proxcal software became available in, uh, in SPSS. And recently, uh, Jan Leeuw and Patrick Meyer um, introduced the SMAC of, uh, in, in R. And I hope and I trust that more people will start to use uh, multidimensional scaling again. I would like to discuss another topic with you, and that is large scale multidimensional scaling. Um, you see some problems with large scale multi multidimensional scaling. Uh, one of them is that it is computationally very demanding. And you can see that from this particular plot for which I used Proxcal and simply generated large, ever larger data matrices or dissimilarity matrices and then simply uh, looked how long it took to converge. Uh, so in essence, and I think I did something like uh, up to 2,500, uh, but at some point it gets really uh, prohibitive. Um, Storage will become a problem when n is large, or really large. Um, and the problem of uninformative solutions uh, um, can be uh, so. So one idea algorithmically is to use only a fraction of the data and throw away uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, the second idea is do this only by using uh, smart designs. And the third one is uh, use this sparseness in the, in the algorithm. Now, we did so. Um, and then you see a solution uh, d down here of, um, of one particular data set of, uh, of, of um, 
uh, associations uh, of words being associated, 23,000 uh, terms, um, and you get the solution. This is, in principle, the constant dissimilarity solution, because most of these words are being only associated a single time. So that's dominant. If you look at the association counts, that the majority of counts will be just one. This is only associated with one other word. So we would like to de-emphasize uh, that idea by using another form of dissimilarities, this, uh, this one, the gravity model, and the se secondly, also using weights um, in this particular way. So this will emphasize the um, larger dissimilarities, as you can uh, see over here. And this is, in principle, uh, still uh, an, a meaningful solution. And of course, representation with large-scale MDS is also um, uh, can be an issue. Uh, this is when you zoom in, and what you can see is on the right-hand corner of food that there are other words associated with food uh, that have, are being drawn in that direction. Um, you saw a bit of my dynamic visualization, and another one which I uh, wanted to show, or that you could look at, is the one by um, um, the GVIS software in uh, GGOBI. I will skip one thing and will show you one last application of uh, interactive uh, multidimensional scaling. Um, this is, um, in, in the Netherlands, we have a, a party comparison website that is being uh, dished up uh, or that comes online every, uh, just before the uh, elections. So also before the last elections in 2010. Uh, and individuals can rate uh, 30 political statements. Now, th these are some of the statements that you see uh, over here. In addition, um, all the parties, or the, in this case, the 11 most important uh, political parties, rate the same items. And the question is, uh, what is the um, political landscape of the Dutch elections in 2010? So that's what I'm going to show you. This is um, um, what you see here. Th this, this flag is the Dutch, um, uh, this is the average D Dutch answer. This is Chris Christian Democrats, the uh, Labour Party, and the small right, right wing Christians. This is the uh, Animal Party, quite uh, small, uh, left wing. Socialist Party, quite uh, uh, left wing. Um, Democrats are, D66 are uh, liberal, uh, liberals, uh, left-wing liberals. This is right-wing, very small. Um, this is uh, right-wing uh, Christians. And this is uh, Geert Wilders. Um, he, he's this uh, right-wing populist guy that, uh, that came up in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so what you see is, oh, and I think I'm still missing uh, one. Uh, um, links, which oh, two actually. This is right-wing uh, liberals, and these are the greens, uh, left uh, uh, greenish. And I'm going to remove this uh, out of it. If you want to know what the current government uh, coalition is, is um, uh, the Christian Democrats, uh, the right-wing liberals, and in essence, they are also supporting uh, the, the government for a majority, although they're not really in, uh, uh, in, in government. The advantage here is that the, um, you could say that the, the um, landscape of the political parties change if you remove uh, some of the political parties. You can emphasize uh, certain aspects uh, if you want, which I will not show uh, right now, um, so that you can see on whatever aspects of the political opinions you find important that will change the political uh, landscape. I believe that uh, these type of um, interactive multidimensional scaling uh, forms can be very useful. Um, we, we have also made, made several ones doing uh, product comparisons uh, for, for websites um, and so on. So this is again the summary of the same, uh, the same topics that I, that I discussed. And 
I think um, I would like to stop here. So thank you for your attention.